Cancer is so rampant in our society, chances are that you know someone currently dealing with it. My friend's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. She had her breasts and lymph nodes removed to prevent further spread. Even so, that doesn't place her entirely out of harm's way. She will still be monitored for growth of new tumors. Despite progress over the decades in how cancer is detected, prevented, and treated, cancer still delivers a heavy death toll. In 2019, cancer accounted for 21% of all deaths. That's 1% more than it accounted for in 1980. While my guest today, Dr. Jason Fung, says this is cause for concern, he points to immunotherapy as the major breakthrough in cancer treatment of the past 10 years. This involves boosting or changing how the immune system works to fight cancer, namely fighting cancer like it's an infection. That is a cluster of rogue cells bent on survival at all costs, no matter what the toll on their human host. Is survival the driving force of cancer's mutations? What factors allow cancer to take hold in the body? And what power lies within our own immune system to bring cancer to heal? Welcome to Vital Science, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Fallon. Dr. Fung is a physician and nephrologist, a specialist in kidney health. He's also the author of number one bestseller, The Obesity Code. Dr. Fung, great to have you back on Vital Signs again. Thanks for having me here. Many of your articles are based on this idea of cancer as being a cell's regression to a, a kind of base state, a survival at all cost state, which accounts for its assault on the human body. On the other side, we have this sophisticated human immune system that is capable of fending off infection and it can even be an antidote to cancer. It's being harnessed by the immunotherapy to fight against cancer. Is it a contradiction that on one side we have this maladaption to a, a cancerous toxic state that attacks the body. On the other side, we have this sophisticated system for fighting off infection and a potential antidote to cancer. Yeah, great question. And, and so this is again, something that we've uh, sort of shifted our thinking about completely, which is that we used to think that cancer was a rare event. So this one cell that is moving towards a cancerous form, which is moving back towards this original single cell uh, organism state is some rare event that happens and then it starts to multiply and so on. It's not, it actually happened all the time. It's happening constantly because we have trillions of cells and some of them are gonna go bad, right? The immune system is actually the primary system that's tasked with identifying these cells. The immune system has a job where it has to identify your own cells versus other cells like bacteria so that it can go kill the bacteria and don't kill your liver, for example, right? So when those cancers, those, those own, your own cells, some of your own cells start to turn into cancerous cells, well, they stop being identified as your own cells and your immune system will therefore go ahead and attack it. This is a process that happens all the time, constantly. There are hundreds or even thousands of cells that are constantly going this, undergoing this cancerous process. And the reason that you don't know about it is because your immune system has basically mopped it all up before you even knew about it. We couldn't even detect it. And your immune system has wiped them out already. So it's, this, it's like a police you know, um, force that goes around and is like, oh, this one's going bad. This one's a criminal. Let's lock it away and take care of it. And, and this, uh, this explains why every drug that reduces your immune system. So we use all these immune suppressing drugs for various diseases like, you know, asthma and so on. Um, if you use them for a long time, they will cause cancer. All of them do. That's why transplant programs are so vigilant about trying to catch cancer because once you give suppressing immune suppressing drugs heavy doses, those cancer cells escape because you're sort of wiping out your own you know, policing force. So not only are you prone to infectious diseases, bacterial infections, 
but you're prone to those cancers as well because cancer really acts as an infectious disease. And that's why your body has natural immune systems. As you get older, those immune systems don't work as well and sometimes the cancer uh, evades surveillance. It's called cancer surveillance. And that's why it's like, oh, now maybe it's important to boost the immune system and try to attack these more. And that's that's where immune therapy is, is such a promising thing. Uh, people are trying to say, okay, let's see how cancer is evading the immune system. Let's try to uncloak it, right? The cancer cells are trying to cloak themselves from the immune system. How are we going to train the immune system to attack? So we take the drugs, for example, we try to pair them. This is CAR T therapy. Try and pair them with their own cancer and try and train your own cells to sort of attack and identify and attack these cells. So very promising uh, treatments that are coming out of this idea. You know, these immune therapies are not trying to kill indiscriminately like chemotherapy is. You're not trying to target genes. You're targeting this disease of cancer as an infectious disease, as a new species. You've given some examples there of, say, older people and also people on certain drugs where the immune system is suppressed. Why do we see such a prevalence of cancer then with younger people who aren't necessarily on, on these kinds of drugs? Why isn't the, their immune system being more proactive in stopping cancer? Uh, it does. It does. But it, the, the new cancers are constantly happening. So, uh, for example, there are cases where... Um, you know, somebody has had a melanoma and, um, you know, it's taken out and is thought to be gone, right? So 20 years after it was gone, they transplanted the lung to somebody else. I think they died in a car accident or something, transplanted somebody else. And though that person developed sort of rampant melanoma, which transferred through the organ because the cancer was still there. It was just being kept in check so efficiently by the immune system that it, it sort of went on. So it's not that, why didn't we take it out? So say you have a young person, a 20 year old, it's like, yeah, they took out all the cancerous cells, but you know, the next day there's like more, but the next day they take them all out again. And the next day there's more, but they take them all out again and it works fine until you suppress that immune system. These immune suppression drugs, when we give, um, when we give regimens for transplant and so on, because that's where you get the heavy, heavy immune suppression. Like you're not talking about, you know, a 5% increased risk, you're you double, triple, quadruple, in some cases, 10 times, like a huge, massive increased risk of cancer. Why? Because you decrease the immune surveillance of that cancer. This really speaks to the, the body's innate ability to defend itself against infection and in certain cases, cancer. With this in mind and the, the development of immunotherapy to harness that immune system power, does this mean that the kind of drastic measures like removal of the breasts where a breast cancer gene is detected, these kinds of measures could be avoided in, in the future? Yeah, and, and that's where um, the research needs to head because you know a lot of people are sort of stuck in this old paradigm of, oh, you have this gene and therefore we need to cut off the breast, for example. So BRCA is a good example because if BRCA gene has been around a long time, but if you look at the number of people with the BR, you know, BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene that develop breast cancer, and you look back in time and you say, okay, I think they looked at the people in the 1940s or 1930s. And the risk was still high, it was like 10 or 20%, I think. But then now in the 2020s, rather than, you know, 80, 90 years ago, the risk actually is closer to 80, 90%. That's the change, right? So the gene is the same. So why is it that back 80, 80 years ago, most of those uh, people didn't develop breast cancer, even though they had the same gene? And it comes to this idea of the seed and the soil, which is that today the breast cancer that the gene is finding a sort of more fertile ground to develop into a cancer compared to before. So you say, what is driving the gene mutations towards survivability, right? And it's chronic damage. If you have any chronic damage to a cell, chronic longstanding damage, you need to get rid of it. So if you have smoke, you know, chronic low level damage by tobacco smoke to the lung cell, that's going to cause lung cancer. So you have to get rid of that. It's not a genetic problem. It's an environmental problem. Same thing with asbestos, right? So to some extent, we've always been trying to do this. That's, that's the whole point of identifying carcinogens. 
So if you say asbestos causes this chronic low level damage to the pleural cells, well, over time, that's going to drive the mesothelioma that you see with asbestos. So it's chronic damage. And anything that causes chronic damage to cells can actually cause cancer. You actually see it even with uh, chemotherapy and radiation. So even the, the, the very things that you use to cure cancer actually cause cancer. So we all know this because if you give somebody radiation, radiation treatment, you can, 10 years down the line, develop secondary cancers. Chemotherapy is, is another example. If you give chemotherapy and you give enough chemotherapy, 10 years down the line, you can have a different cancer that arose because of your chemotherapy or because of your radiation. So the things that you use to cure the cancer can cause a cancer. Why? Because they cause cellular damage. That's an interesting thought because then then you have to then you have to try and think, okay, are there other ways to treat the cancer? Are there other ways to prevent the cancer? And this takes you away from thinking about the genes and thinking about the environment.